Chapter 2 The Mission of Seyyid Khazim i Rashti The news of the passing of his beloved master brought unspeakable sorrow to the heart of Seyyid Khazim. Inspired by the verse of the Quran, Fain would they put out God's light with their mouths, but God only desireth to perfect his light, albeit the infidels abhor it. He arose with unswerving purpose to consummate the task with which Sheikh Ahmad had entrusted him. He found himself, after the removal of so distinguished a protector, a victim of the slanderous tongue and unrelating enmity of the people around him. They attacked his person, scorned his teachings, and reviled his name. At the instigation of a powerful and notorious Shia leader, Sid Ibrahim i Kazvini, the enemies of Sid Kazim lead together and determine to destroy him. Thereupon, Sid Kazim conceived the plan of securing the support and goodwill of one of the most formidable and outstanding ecclesiastical dignitaries of Persia, the renowned Haji Sid Muhammad Bakir i Rashti, who lived in Isfahan and whose authority extended far beyond the confines of that city. This friendship and sympathy, Seyyid Khazim thought, would enable him to pursue untrammeled the course of his activities, and would considerably enhance the influence which he exercised over his disciples. Would that one amongst you, he was often heard to say to his followers, could arise and with complete detachment journey to Isfahan and deliver this message from me to that learned Seyyid. Why is it that in the beginning you showed such marked consideration and affection for the late Sheikh Ahmad, and now have suddenly detached yourself from the body of his chosen disciples? Why is it that you have abandoned us to the mercy of our opponents? Would that such a messenger, putting his trust in God, might arise to unravel whatever mysteries perplex the mind of that learned seed, and dispel such doubts as might have alienated his sympathy? Would that he were able to obtain from him a solemn declaration testifying to the unquestioned authority of Sheikh Ahmad and to the truth and soundness of his teachings. Would, would that he also, after having secured such a testimony, might visit Mashhad and there obtain a similar pronouncement from Mirza Askari, the foremost ecclesiastical leader in that holy city, and then, having completed his mission, might return in triumph to this place. Again and again did Seyyid Kazim find opportunity to reiterate his appeal. None, however, ventured to respond to his call, except a certain Mirza Muhit i Kirmani, who expressed readiness to undertake this mission. To him, Seyyid Kazim replied, Beware of touching the lion's tail, belittle not the delicacy and difficulty of such a mission. He then, turning his face towards his youthful disciple, Mullah Hussein i Bushrui, the bubble barb addressed him in these words, Arise and perform this mission, for I declare you equal to this task. The Almighty will graciously assist you and will crown your endeavors with success. There is a footnote. Mullah Hussein i Bushrui, the bubble barb, was the first to believe in the barb who gave him this title. Mullah Hussein joyously sprang to his feet, kissed the hem of his teacher's garment, vowed his loyalty to him and started forthwith on his journey. With complete severance and noble reserve, he set out to achieve his end. Arriving in Isfahan, he sought immediately the presence of the learned Seyyid. Clad in mean attire and laden with the dust of travel, he appeared amidst the vast and richly apparelled company of the disciples of that distinguished leader, an insignificant and negligible figure. Unobserved and undaunted, he advanced to a place which faced the seat occupied by that renowned teacher. Summoning to his aid all the courage and confidence with which the instructions of Seyyid Qasim had inspired him, he addressed Haji Seyyid Muhammad Bakir in these words, Hearken, O Seyyid, to my words, for response to my plea will ensure the safety of the faith of the Prophet of God, and refusal to consider my message will cause it grievous injury. These bold and courageous words, uttered with directness and force, produced a surprising impression upon the Seed. He suddenly interrupted his discourse, and, ignoring his audience, listened with close attention to the message which this strange visitor had brought. His disciples, amazed at this extraordinary behavior, rebuked this sudden intruder, 
and denounced his presumptuous pretensions. With extreme politeness in firm and dignified language, Mullah Hussein hinted at their discourtesy and shallowness and expressed surprise at their arrogance and vain glory. The Seed was highly pleased with the demeanour and argument which the visitor so strikingly displayed. He deplored and apologised for the unseemly conduct of his own disciples. In order to compensate for their ingratitude, he extended every conceivable kindness to that youth, assured him of his support, and besought him to deliver his message. Thereupon, Mullah Hussein acquainted him with the nature and object of the mission with which he had been entrusted. To this the learned Si had replied, As we in the beginning believed that both Sheikh Ahmad and Seed Qazim were actuated by no desire except to advance the cause of knowledge and safeguard the sacred interests of the faith, we felt prompted to extend to them our heartiest support and to extol their teachings. In later years, however, we have noticed so many conflicting statements and obscure and mysterious allusions in their writings that we felt it advisable to keep silent for a time and to refrain from either censure or applause. To this, Mullah Hussein replied, I cannot but deplore such silence on your part, for I firmly believe that it involves the loss of a splendid opportunity to advance the cause of truth. It is for you to set forth specifically such passages in their writings as appear to you mysterious or inconsistent with the precepts of the faith, and I will, with the aid of God, undertake to expound their true meaning. The poise, the dignity and confidence which characterize the behavior of this unexpected messenger greatly impressed Haji Seed Muhammad Bakir. He begged him not to press the matter at this moment, but to wait until a later day, when in private converse you might acquaint him with his own doubts and misgivings. Mullah Hussein, however, feeling that delay might prove harmful to the cause he had at heart, insisted upon an immediate conference with him about the weighty problems which he felt impelled and able to resolve. The seer was moved to tears by the youthful enthusiasm, the sincerity and serene confidence to which the countenance of Mullah Hussein so admirably testified. He sent immediately for some of the works written by Sheikh Ahmad and Seyyid Qazim and began to question Mullah Hussein regarding those passages which had excited his disapproval and surprise. To each reference the messenger replied with characteristic vigour, with masterly knowledge and befitting modesty. He continued in this manner in the presence of the assembled disciples to expound the teachings of Sheikh Ahmad and Seyyid Qazim to vindicate their truth and to defend their cause until the time when the muazzin, calling the faithful to prayer, suddenly interrupted the flow of his argument. The next day, he similarly, in the presence of a large and representative assembly, and whilst facing the seed, resumed his eloquent defence of the high mission entrusted by an almighty providence to Sheikh Ahmad and his successor. A deep silence fell upon his hearers. They were seized with wonder at the cogency of his argument and the tone and manner of his speech. The seer publicly promised that on the following day he would himself issue a written declaration wherein he would testify to the eminence of the position held by both Sheikh Ahmad and Seyyid Qazim, and would pronounce whosoever deviated from their path as one who had turned aside from the faith of the Prophet himself. He would likewise bear witness to their penetrative insight and their correct and profound understanding of the mysteries which the faith of Muhammad enshrined. The seer redeemed his pledge, and with his own hand penned the promised declaration. He wrote at length, and in the course of his testimony paid a tribute to the character and learning of Mullah Hussein. He spoke in glowing terms of Seyyid Qazim, apologized for his former attitude, and expressed the hope that in the days to come, he might be enabled to make amends for his past and regrettable conduct towards him. He read himself to the disciples the text of this written testimony and delivered it unsealed to Mullah Hussein, authorizing him to share its contents with whomsoever he pleased, that all might know the extent of his devotion to Seyyid Qazim. No sooner had Mullah Hussein retired than the Seyyid charged one of his trusted attendants to follow in the footsteps of the visitor and find out the place where he was residing. The attendant followed him to a modest building which served as a madrissi, a 
and saw him enter a room which, except for a worn-out mat which covered its floor, was devoid of furniture. He watched him arrive, offer his prayer and thanksgiving to God, and lie down upon that mat with nothing to cover him except his other. Having reported to his master all that he had observed, the attendant was again instructed to deliver to Mullah Hussein the sum of a hundred tumans, and to express his sincere apologies of his master for his inability to extend to so remarkable a messenger a hospitality that befitted his station. To this offer Mullah Hussein sent the following reply, Tell your master that his real gift to me is the spirit of fairness with which he received me, and the open-mindedness which prompted him, despite his exalted rank, to respond to the message which I, a lowly stranger, brought him. Return this money to your master, for I, as a messenger, ask for neither recompense nor reward. We nourish your souls for the sake of God. We seek from you neither recompense nor thanks. The Quran 76, 9 My prayer for your master is that earthly leadership may never hinder him from acknowledging and testifying to the truth. There is a footnote here. The Bab in the Dala il Isabi refers to Mullah Hussein in these terms. You especially know who is the first witness of that faith. You know that the majority of the doctors of the Sheikhi and the Siyadiyya and other sects admired his science and his talent. When he came to Isfahan, the urchins of the town cried out as he passed, Ah, ah, a ragged student has just arrived. But behold, this man by his proofs and arguments convinced to see it, one known for his proven scientific knowledge, Muhammad Bakir. Truly, that is one of the proofs of this manifestation, for after the death of the Seed, this personage went out to see most of the doctors of Islam and found truth only with a master of truth. It was then that he attained the destiny which had been determined for him. In truth, the people of the beginning and of the end of this manifestation envy him and will envy him until the day of judgment. And who then can accuse this master mind of mental weakness and infidelity? From the Book of Seven Proofs, translated by A. L. M. Nichols, page 54. Haji Seyed Muhammad Bakir died before the year A. H. 1260, A. D. 1844, the year that witnessed the birth of the faith proclaimed by the Bard. He remained to his last moment a staunch supporter and fervent admirer of Syed Qasim. Having fulfilled the first part of his mission, Mullah Hussein dispatched this written testimony of Haji Syed Muhammad Bakir to his master in Karbala and directed his steps towards Mashhad, determined to deliver to the best of his ability the message which he was charged to give to Mirza Askari. Immediately the letter, enclosing the Seer's written declaration, was delivered to Seer Kazim. The latter was so rejoiced that he forthwith sent to Mullah Hussein his reply, expressing his grateful appreciation of the exemplary manner in which he had discharged his trust. He was so delighted with the answer he received that, interrupting the course of his lecture, he read out to his disciples both the letter of Mullah Hussein and the written testimony enclosed in the letter. He afterwards shared with them the epistle which he himself had written to Mullah Hussein in recognition of the remarkable service he had rendered him. In it, Syed Kazim paid such a glowing tribute to his high attainments, to his ability and character, that a few among those who heard it suspected that Mullah Hussein was that promised one to whom their master unceasingly referred, the one whom he so often declared to be living in their very midst, and yet to have remained unrecognized by them all. That communication enjoined upon Mullah Hussein the fear of God urged him to regard it as the most potent instrument with which to withstand the onslaught of the enemy and the distinguishing feature of every true follower of the faith. It was couched in such terms of tender affection that no one who read it could doubt that the writer was bidding farewell to his beloved disciple and that he entertained no hope of ever meeting him again in this world. In those days, Seed Kazim became increasingly aware of the approach of the hour at which the Promised One was to be revealed. He realized how dense were those veils that hindered the seekers from apprehending the glory of the concealed manifestation. 
he accordingly exerted his utmost endeavour to remove, gradually, with caution and wisdom, whatever barriers might stand in the way of the full recognition of that hidden treasure of God. He repeatedly urged his disciples to bear in mind the fact that he whose advent they were expecting would appear neither from Jabulka nor from Jabulsa. A footnote says, Mysterious cities from one of which Imam Mihdi will appear. He even hinted at his presence in their very midst. You behold him with your own eyes, he often observed, and yet recognize him not. To his disciples who questioned him regarding the signs of the manifestation, he would say, He is of noble lineage. He is a descendant of the prophet of God, of the family of Hashim. He is young in age, and is possessed of innate knowledge. His learning is derived not from the teachings of Sheikh Ahmad, but from God. My knowledge is but a drop compared with the immensity of his knowledge. My attainments a speck of dust in the face of the wonders of his grace and power. Nay, immeasurable is the difference. He is of medium height, abstains from smoking, and is of extreme devoutness and piety. Certain of the Seed's disciples, despite the testimonies of their master, believed him to be the promised one, for in him they recognized the signs to which he was alluding. Among them was a certain Mullah Midi Ikui, who went so far as to make public this belief. Whereupon the Seer was sore displeased, and would have cast him out from the company of his chosen followers, had he not begged forgiveness and expressed his repentance for his action. Sheikh Hassan Izunuzi himself informed me that he too entertained such doubts, that he prayed to God that if his supposition was well founded, he should be confirmed in his belief, and if not, that he should be delivered from such idle fancy. I was so perturbed, he once related to me, that for days I could neither eat nor sleep. My days were spent in the service of Zied Kazim, to whom I was greatly attached. One day at the hour of dawn, I was suddenly awakened by Mullah Noruz, one of his intimate attendants, who in great excitement bade me arise and follow him. We went to the house of Syed Kazim, where we found him fully dressed, wearing his abba, and ready to leave his home. He asked me to accompany him. A highly esteemed and distinguished person, he said, has arrived. I feel it incumbent upon both of us to visit him. The morning light had just broken when I found myself walking with him through the streets of Kabila. We soon reached a house, at the door of which stood a youth, as if expectant to receive us. He wore a green turban, and his countenance revealed an expression of humility and kindliness which I can never describe. He quietly approached us, extended his arms towards Syed Kazim, and lovingly embraced him. His affability and loving kindness singularly contrasted with the sense of profound reverence that characterized the attitude of Syed Kazim towards him. Speechless and with bowed head, he received the many expressions of affection and esteem with which that youth greeted him. We were soon led by him to the upper floor of that house, and entered a chamber bedecked with flowers and redolent of the loveliest perfume. He bade us be seated. We knew not, however, what seats we actually occupied, so overpowering was the sense of delight which seized us. We observed a silver cup, which had been placed in the centre of the room, which our youthful host, soon after we were seated, filled to overflowing, and handed to Seed Kazim, saying, A drink of a pure beverage shall their lord give them. Quran 76.21 Seed Kazim held the cup with both hands and quaffed it. A feeling of reverent joy filled his being, a feeling which he could not suppress. I too was presented with a cup full of that beverage, though no words were addressed to me. All that was spoken at that memorable gathering was the above-mentioned verse of the Koran. Soon after, the host arose from his seat and, accompanying us to the threshold of the house, bade us farewell. I was mute with wonder. I knew not how to express the cordiality of his welcome, the dignity of his bearing, the charm of that face, and the delicious fragrance of that beverage. How great was my amazement when I saw my teacher quaff without the least hesitation that holy draught from a silver cup, the use of which, according to the precepts of Islam, 
is forbidden to the faithful. I could not explain the motive which could have induced the seed to manifest such profound reverence in the presence of that youth, a reverence which even the sight of the shrine of the Siddu Shuhada had failed to excite. Three days later I saw that same youth arrive and take his seat in the midst of the company of the assembled disciples of Seed Kazim. He sat close to the threshold, and with the same modesty and dignity of bearing listened to the discourse of the Seed. As soon as his eyes fell upon that youth, the Seed discontinued his address and held his peace, whereupon one of his disciples begged him to resume the argument which he had left unfinished. What more shall I say? replied Seed Kazim, as he turned his face toward the barb. Lo, the truth is more manifest than the ray of light that has fallen upon that lap. I immediately observed that the ray to which the Seed referred had fallen upon the lap of that same youth whom we had recently visited. Why is it, that questioner inquired, that you neither reveal his name nor identify his person? To this the seer replied by pointing with his finger to his own throat, implying that were he to divulge his name, they both would be put to death instantly. This added still further to my perplexity. I had already heard my teacher observe that so great is the perversity of this generation, that were he to point with his finger to the promised one and say, He indeed is the Beloved, the desire of your hearts and mine, they would still fail to recognize and acknowledge him. I saw the seer actually point out with his finger the ray of light that had fallen on that lap, and yet none among those who were present seemed to apprehend its meaning. I, for my part, was convinced that the seed himself could never be the promised one, but that a mystery inscrutable to us all lay concealed in that strange and attractive youth. Several times I ventured to approach Seed Kazim and seek from him an elucidation of this mystery. Every time I approached him I was overcome by a sense of awe which his personality so powerfully inspired. Many a time I heard him remark, O oh, Sheikh Hassan, rejoice that your name is Hassan, praiseworthy. Hassan, your beginning, and Hassan, your end. You have been privileged to attain to the day of Sheikh Ahmad. You have been closely associated with me, and in the days to come yours shall be the inestimable joy of beholding what I have not seen, ear heard not, nor any heart conceived. I often felt the urge to seek alone the presence of that Hashemite youth, and to endeavour to fathom his mystery. I watched him several times as he stood in an attitude of prayer at the doorway of the shrine of the Imam Hussein. So wrapped was he in his devotions that he seemed utterly oblivious of those around him. Tears ringed from his eyes, and from his lips fell words of glorification and praise of such power and beauty as even the noblest passages of our sacred scriptures could not hope to surpass. The words, O oh God, my God, my beloved, my heart's desire, were uttered with a frequency and ardor that those of the visiting pilgrims who were near enough to hear him instinctively interrupted the course of their devotions and marveled at the evidences of piety and veneration which that youthful countenance evinced. Like him, they were moved to tears, and from him they learned the lesson of true adoration. Having completed his prayers, that youth, without crossing the threshold of the shrine and without attempting to address any words to those around him, would quietly return to his home. I felt the impulse to address him, but every time I ventured an approach, a force that I could neither explain nor resist detained me. My inquiries about him elicited the information that he was a resident of Shiraz, that he was a merchant by profession and did not belong to any of the ecclesiastical orders. I was, moreover, informed that he, and also his uncles and relatives, were among the lovers and admirers of Sheikh Ahmad and Seyyid Kazim. Soon after, I learned that he had departed for Najaf on his way to Shiraz. That youth had set my heart aflame, 
The memory of that vision haunted me. My soul was wedded to his till the day when the call of a youth from Shiraz, proclaiming himself to be the Bab, reached my ears. The thought instantly flashed through my mind that such a person could be none other than that self-same youth whom I had seen in Kabila, the youth of my heart's desire. When later on I journeyed from Kabila to Shiraz, I found that he had set out on a pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. I met him on his return, and endeavoured, despite the many obstacles in my way, to remain in close association with him. And subsequently he was incarcerated in the fortress of Maku, in the province of Azerbaijan, I was engaged in transcribing the verses which he dictated to his amanuensis. Every night, for a period of nine months, during which he was a prisoner in that fort, he revealed, after he had offered his evening prayer, a commentary on a juz of the Koran. A juz is one-thirtieth of the Koran. At the end of each month, the commentary on the whole of that sacred book was thus completed. During his incarceration in Marku, nine commentaries on the whole of the Koran had been revealed by him. The texts of these commentaries were entrusted in Tabriz to the keeping of a certain Seed Ibrahim e Khalil, who was instructed to conceal them until the time for their publication might arrive. Their fate is unknown until now. In connection with one of these commentaries, the Bab one day asked me, Which do you prefer, this commentary which I have revealed, or the Asanul Kizath, my previous commentary on the Suri of Joseph? Which of the two is superior in your estimation? To me, I replied, the Asanul Kizas seems to be endowed with greater power and charm. He smiled at my observation and said, You are as yet unfamiliar with the tone and tenor of this later commentary. The truths enshrined in this will more speedily and effectively enable the seeker to attain the object of his quest. I continued to be closely associated with him until that great encounter of Sheikh Tabasi. When informed of that event, the Bab directed all his companions to hasten to that spot and extend every assistance in their power to Kudus, his heroic and distinguished disciple. Addressing me one day, he said, But for my incarceration in the jabal e shadid the fortress of Shirik, it would have been incumbent upon me to lend my personal assistance to my beloved Kudus. Participation in that struggle is not enjoined upon you. You should proceed to Kabila, and should abide in that holy city, inasmuch as you are destined to behold with your own eyes the beauteous countenance of the promised Hussein. As you gaze upon that radiant face, do also remember me. Convey to him the expression of my loving devotion. He again emphatically added these words, Verily I say, I have entrusted you with a great mission. Beware lest your heart grow faint, lest you forget the glory with which I have invested you. Soon after, I journeyed to Kabila and lived as bidden in that holy city. Fearing that my prolonged stay in that center of pilgrimage might excite suspicion, I decided to marry. I started to earn my livelihood as a scribe, what afflictions befell me at the hands of the Sheikhis, those who professed to be the followers of Sheikh Ahmad and yet failed to recognize the Bab. Mindful of the counsels of that beloved youth, I patiently submitted to the indignities inflicted upon me. For two years I lived in that city. Meanwhile, that holy youth was released from his earthly prison and through his martyrdom, was delivered from the atrocious cruelties that had beset the closing years of his life. Sixteen lunar months, less twenty and two days, had elapsed since the day of the martyrdom of the Bab, when on the day of Arafi, that is the ninth day of the month of Jil Hiji, in the year A.H. 1267, that is the 5th of October A.D. 1851, while I was passing by the gate of the inner courtyard of the shrine of the Imam Hussein, my eyes, for the first time, fell upon Baha'u'llah. What shall I recount regarding the countenance which I beheld? The beauty of that face, those exquisite features which no pen or brush dare describe, his penetrating glance, his kindly face, 
majesty of his bearing, the sweetness of his smile, the luxuriance of his jet black flowing locks, left an indelible impression upon my soul. I was then an old man, bowed with age. How lovingly he advanced towards me. He took me by the hand, and in a tone which at once betrayed power and beauty, addressed me in these words. This very day, I have purposed to make you known as a Barbie throughout Carbilla. Still holding my hand in his, he continued to converse with me. He walked with me all along the market street, and in the end he said, Praise be to God that you have remained in Carbilla, and have beheld with your own eyes the countenance of the promised Hussein. I recalled instantly the promise which had been given me by the Bab, his words, which I had regarded as referring to a remote future, I had not shared with anyone. These words of Baha'u'llah moved me to the depths of my being. I felt impelled to proclaim to a heedless people at that very moment, and with all my soul and power, the advent of the promised Hussein. He bade me, however, repress my feelings and conceal my emotions. Not yet, he breathed into my ears. The appointed hour is approaching. It has not yet struck. Rest assured and be patient. From that moment, all my sorrows vanished. My soul was flooded with joy. In those days, I was so poor that most of the time I hungered for food. I felt so rich, however, that all the treasures of the earth melted away into nothingness compared with that which I already possessed. Such is the grace of God, to whom he will he giveth it. He verily is of immense bounty. I now return after this digression to my theme. I had been referring to the eagerness with which Seed Kazim had determined to rend asunder those veils which intervened between the people of his day and the recognition of the promised manifestation. In the introductory pages of his works, entitled Shai Khasidi and Shai Kutbi, he, in veiled language, alludes to the blessed name of Baha'u'llah. In a booklet, the last he wrote, he explicitly mentions the name of the Bab by his reference to the term Zikrullah i Azam. In it he writes, addressing this noble Zikr, Zikr means mention or remembrance. Addressing this noble zikr, this mighty voice of God, I say, I am apprehensive of the people, lest they harm you. I am apprehensive of my own self, lest I too may hurt you. I fear you. I tremble at your authority. I dread the age in which you live. Were I to treasure you as the apple of my eye until the day of resurrection, I would not sufficiently have proved my devotion to you. How grievously Seed Kazim suffered at the hands of the people of wickedness. What harm that villainous generation inflicted upon him. For years he suffered silently and endured with heroic patience all the indignities, the calumnies, the denunciations that were heaped upon him. He was destined, however, to witness during the last years of his life how the avenging hand of God destroyed with utter destruction those that opposed, vilified, and plotted against him. In those days, the followers of Seyyid Ibrahim, that notorious enemy of Seyyid Qazim, banded themselves together for the purpose of stirring up sedition and mischief and endangering the life of their formidable adversary. By every means at their disposal, they sought to poison the minds of his admirers and friends, to undermine his authority and to discredit his name. No voice was raised in protest against the ag agitation that was being sedulously prepared by that ungodly and treacherous people, each of whom professed to be the exponent of true learning and the repository of the mysteries of the faith of God. No one sought to warn or awaken them. They gathered such force and kindled such strife that they succeeded in evicting from Kabila in a disgraceful manner the representative official of the Ottoman government and appropriated for their own sordid aims whatever revenues accrued to him. 
Their menacing attitude aroused the central government at Constantinople, which dispatched a military official to the scene of agitation with full instructions to quench the fires of mischief. With the force at his command, that official besieged that city and dispatched a communication to Syed Kazim in which he entreated him to pacify the mind of the excited populace. He appealed to him to counsel moderation to its inhabitants, to induce them to relax their stubbornness and to surrender voluntarily to his rule. Were they to heed his counsels, he promised that he would undertake to ensure their safety and protection, would proclaim a general amnesty and would strive to promote their welfare. If they refused, however, to submit, he warned them that their lives would be in danger, that a great calamity would surely befall them. Upon the receipt of this formal communication, Syed Kazim summoned to his presence the chief instigators of the movement, and with the utmost wisdom and affection exhorted them to cease their agitation and surrender their arms. He spoke with such persuasive eloquence, such sincerity and detachment, that their hearts were softened and their resistance was subdued. They solemnly undertook to throw open the next morning the gates of the citadel, and to present themselves in the company of Syed Kazim to the officer in command of the besieging forces. It was agreed that the Syed would, would intervene in their behalf and secure for them whatever would ensure their tranquility and welfare. No sooner had they left the presence of the Syed and the Ulamas, the chief instigators of the rebellion, unanimously arose to frustrate this plan. Fully aware that such intervention on the part of the Syed who had already excited their envy, would serve to enhance his prestige and consolidate his authority, they determined to persuade a number among the foolish and excitable elements of the population to sally forth at night and attack the forces of the enemy. They assured them of victory on the strength of a dream in which one of their members had seen Abbas, the brother of the Imam Hussein, who had charged him to incite his followers to wage holy war against the besiegers and had given him the promise of ultimate success. Deluded by this vain promise, they rejected the advice tendered by that wise and judicious counsellor and arose to execute the designs of their foolish leaders. Syed Kazim, who was well aware of the evil influence that actuated that revolt, addressed a detailed and faithful report on the situation to the Turkish commander, who again wrote to Syed Kazim, reiterated his appeal for a peaceful settlement of the issue. He, moreover, declared that at a given time he would force the gates of the citadel and would regard the home of the Seed as the only place of refuge for a defeated enemy. This declaration the Seed caused to be spread throughout the city. It served only to excite the derision and contempt of the population. When informed of the reception accorded that declaration, the seer remarked from the Quran 1181, Verily, that with which they are threatened is for the morning. Is not the morning near? At daybreak, the appointed hour, the forces of the enemy bombarded the ramparts of the citadel, demolished its walls, entered the city, and pillaged and massacred a considerable number of its population. Many fled in consternation to the courtyard of the shrine of the Imam Hussein. Others sought refuge in the sanctuary of Abbas. Those who loved and honoured Syed Kazim betook themselves to his home. So great was the crowd that hastened to the shelter of his residence that it was found necessary to appropriate a number of the adjoining houses in order to accommodate the multitude of refugees who pressed at its doors. So vast and excited was the concourse that thronged his house that when once the tumult had subsided, it was ascertained that no less than twenty-two persons had been trampled to death. What consternation seized the residents and visitors of that holy city? With what severity did the victors treat their terrified enemy? With what audacity they ignored those sacred rights and prerogatives with which the piety of countless Muslim pilgrims had invested the holy sites of Kabila? They refused to recognize alike the shrine of the Imam Hussein and the sacred mausoleum of Abbas as inviolable sanctuaries for the thousands who fled before the avenging wrath of an alien people. The hallowed precincts of both these shrines ran with the blood of the victims. One place, and only one, could assert its right of sanctuary to the innocent and the faithful among the population. 
that place was the residence of Seed Kazim. His house, with its dependencies, was regarded as being endowed with such sanctity as even the most hallowed shrine of Shia Islam had failed to retain. That strange manifestation of the avenging wrath of God was an object lesson to those who were inclined to belittle the station of that holy man. That memorable event happened on the 8th of Dil Hiji in the year AH 1258, the 12th of January AD 1843. It is admittedly evident that in every age and dispensation, those whose mission it is either to proclaim the truth or to prepare the way for its acceptance have invariably been opposed by a number of powerful adversaries who challenged their authority and attempted to pervert their teachings. These have, either by fraud or pretense, calumny or oppression, succeeded for a time in beguiling the uninformed and in misleading the feeble. Desirous of maintaining their hold over the thoughts and consciences of men, they have, so long as the faith of God remained concealed, been able to enjoy the fruits of a fleeting and precarious ascendancy. No sooner was the faith proclaimed, however, than they found to their utter dismay the effects of their dark plottings pale before the dawning light of the new day of God. Before the fierce rays of that rising orb, all their machinations and evil deeds faded into nothingness and were soon a thing forgotten. Around Seed Kazim were likewise gathered a number of vain and ignoble people who feigned devotion and attachment to his person, who professed to be devout and pious, and who claimed to be the sole repositories of the mysteries enshrined in the utterances of Sheikh Ahmad and his successor. They occupied the seats of honor in the company of the assembled disciples of Seed Kazim. To them he addressed his disclosure, and towards them he showed marked consideration and courtesy. And yet he often, in covert and subtle phrases, alluded to their blindness, their vainglory, and their utter inaptitude for the apprehension of the mysteries of the divine utterance. Among his allusions were the following. None can comprehend my language except him who is begotten of me. Oftentimes he quoted this saying, I am spellbound by the vision, I am mute with wonder, and behold the world bereft of the power of hearing. I am powerless to divulge the mystery and find the people incapable of bearing its weight. On another occasion he remarked, Many are those who claim to have attained union with the Beloved, and yet that Beloved refuses to acknowledge their claim. By the tears which he sheds for his loved one, can the true lover be distinguished from the false. Many a time he observed, He who is destined to be made manifest after me is a pure lineage of illustrious descent of the seed of Fatime, he is of medium height and is free from bodily deficiency. I have heard Sheikh Abu Turab, a footnote says, one of the leading disciples of Seyyid Kazim, he married the sister of Mullah Hussein, he died while in prison in Tehran. I have heard Sheikh Abu Turab recount the following. I, together with a number of the disciples of Seyyid Kazim, regarded the allusion to these deficiencies from which the Seyyid declared the promised one to be free, as specifically directed towards three individuals among our fellow disciples. We even designated them by such appellations as indicated their bodily defects. One of them was Haji Mirza Karim Khan. A footnote says, The Bab wrote to Haji Muhammad Karim Khan and invited him to acknowledge his authority. This the latter not only entirely refused to do, but further wrote a treatise against the Bab and his doctrines. Page 910 at least two such treatises were written by Haji Muhammad Karim Khan. One of them was composed at a later date than this, probably after the Bab's death, at the special request of Nazir din Shah. Of these two, one has been printed and is called The Crushing Falsehood, Isakul Batil, footnote, page, footnote 1, page 910, Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, 1889, Article 12. 
One of them was Hajimeza Karim Khan, son of Ibrahim Khan i Kajar i Kirmani, who was both one-eyed and sparsely bearded. Another was Mirza Hassan i Gauhar, an exceptionally corpulent man. The third was Mirza Muhit i Shair i Kirmani, who was extraordinarily lean and tall. We felt convinced that these were none other than those to whom the Seer constantly alluded as those vain and faithless people who would eventually reveal their real selves and betray their ingratitude and folly. As to Haji Mirza Karim Khan, who for years sat at the feet of Seer Kazim and acquired from him all his so-called learning, in the end he obtained leave from his master to settle in Kirman, and there engage in the promotion of the interests of Islam and the dissemination of those traditions that clustered round the sacred memory of the Imams of the faith. I was present in the library of Seyyid Qasim when one day an attendant of Haji Mirza Karim Khan arrived, holding a book in his hand, which he presented to the Seyyid on behalf of his master, re requesting him to peruse it and to signify in his own handwriting his approval of its contents. The Seyyid read portions of that book and returned it to the attendant with the message, Tell your master that he, better than anyone else, can estimate the value of his own book. The attendant had retired when the seed, with sorrowful voice, remarked, Accursed be he! For years he has been associated with me, and now that he intends to depart, his one aim, after so many years of study and companionship, is to diffuse through his book such heretical and atheistic doctrines as he now wishes me to endorse. He has covenanted with a number of self-seeking hypocrites with the view of establishing himself in Kirman, and in order to assume after my departure from this world the reins of undisputed leadership. How grievously he erred in his judgment! For the breeze of divine revelation, wafted from the dayspring of guidance, will assuredly quench his light and destroy his influence. The tree of his endeavour will eventually yield naught but the fruit of bitter disillusion and gnawing remorse. Verily, I say, you shall behold this with your own eyes. My prayer for you is that you may be protected from the mischievous influence which he, the Antichrist of the promised revelation, will in future exercise. He bade me conceal his prediction until the day of resurrection the day when the hand of omnipotence will have disclosed the secrets which are now hidden within the breasts of men. On that day, he exhorted me, arise with unswerving purpose and determination for the triumph of the faith of God. Publish far and wide all that you have heard and witnessed. This same Sheikh Abu Turab, who in the early days of the dispensation proclaimed by the Bab, thought it wiser and better not to identify himself with his cause, cherished in his heart the fondest love for the revealed manifestation, and in his faith remained firm and immovable as the rock. Eventually that smouldering fire blazed forth in his soul and was responsible for such behavior on his part as to cause him to suffer imprisonment in Tehran, in the same dungeon within which Baha'u'llah was confined. He remained steadfast to the very end and crowned a life of loving sacrifice the glory of martyrdom. And as the days of Sid Kazim drew to a close, he, whenever he met his disciples, whether in private converse or public discourse, exhorted them, saying, O oh, my beloved companions, beware, beware, lest after me the world's fleeting vanities beguile you. Beware lest you wax haughty and forgetful of God. It is incumbent upon you to renounce all comfort all earthly possessions and kindred, in your quest of him who is the desire of your hearts and of mine. Scatter far and wide, detach yourselves from all earthly things, and humbly and prayerfully beseech your Lord to sustain and guide you. Never relax in your determination to seek and find him who is concealed behind the veils of glory. Persevere till the time when he who is your true guide and master will graciously aid you and enable you to recognize him. Be firm till the day when he will choose you as the companions and the heroic supporters of the promised Qaim. Well is it with every one of you who will quaff the cup of martyrdom in his path. 
those of you whom God in his wisdom will preserve and keep to witness the setting of the star of divine guidance, that harbinger of the sun of divine revelation, must needs be patient, must, must remain assured and steadfast. Such ones amongst you must neither falter nor feel dismayed, for soon after the first trumpet blast, which is to smite the earth with extermination and death, there shall be sounded again yet another call at which all things shall be quickened and revived. Then will the meaning of these sacred verses be revealed, and there was a blast on the trumpet, and all who are in the heavens, and all who are in the earth expired, save those whom God permitted to live. Then was there sounded another blast, and lo, arising, they gazed around them, and the earth shone with the light of her Lord, and the book was set, and the prophets were brought up the witnesses, and judgment was given between them with equity, and none was wronged. Quran thirty nine sixty eight. Verily I say, after the Qayyum, the Qayyum, will be made manifest. Footnote says, references to the Bab and to Baha'u'llah respectively. For when the star of the former has set, the sun of the beauty of Hussein will arise and illuminate the whole world. Then will be unfolded in all its glory the mystery and the secret spoken of by Sheikh Ahmad, who has said, The mystery of this cause must needs be made manifest, and the secret of this message must needs be divulged. To have attained unto the day of days is to have attained unto the crowning glory of past generations, and one goodly deed performed in that age is equal to the pious worship of countless ages. How often has that venerable soul, Sheikh Ahmad, recited those verses of the Qur'an already referred to? What stress he laid upon their significance as foreshadowing the advent of those twin revelations which are to follow each other in rapid succession, and each of which is destined to suffuse the world with all its glory. How many times did he exclaim, well is it with him who will recognize their significance and behold their splendor. How often, addressing me, did he remark, Neither of us shall live to gaze upon their effulgent glory, but many of the faithful among your disciples shall witness the day which we, alas, can never hope to behold. O oh, my beloved companions, how great, how very great is this cause! How exalted the station to which I summon you, how great the mission for which I have trained and prepared you. Gird up the loins of endeavor and fix your gaze upon his promise. I pray to God graciously to assist you to weather the storms of tests and trials which must needs beset you, to enable you to emerge unscathed and triumphant from their midst and to lead you to your high destiny. Every year, in the month of Zil Qadi, the Seed would proceed from Kabila to Kazimain in order to visit the shrines of the Imams. Footnote says, the tombs of the two Qazims, the seventh Imam Musa Qazim and the ninth Imam Muhammad Taki, about three miles north of Baghdad. Around them has grown up a considerable town inhabited chiefly by Persians known as Kazimain. He would return to Karbala in time to visit, on the day of Arafi, the shrine of the Imam Hussein. In that year, in that year, the last year of his life, he, faithful to his custom, departed from Karbala in the first days of the month of Zil Qadi, in the year A.H. 1259, the 23rd of November to the 23rd of December, A.D. 1843, accompanied by a number of his companions and friends. On the fourth day of that month he arrived at the Majid i Baratha, situated on the highway between Baghdad and Khazimain, in time to offer up his noonday prayer. He bade the Muazin summon the faithful to gather and pray. Standing beneath the shade of a palm which faced the Majid, he joined the congregation and had just concluded his devotions when an Arab suddenly appeared, approached the Seed and embraced him. Three days ago, he said, I was shepherding my flock in this adjoining pasture when sleep suddenly fell upon me. In my dream I saw Muhammad, the apostle of God, who addressed me in these words, 
Give ear, O shepherd, to my words, and treasure them within your heart, for these words of mine are the trust of God which I commit to your keeping. If you be faithful to them, great will be your reward. If you neglect them, grievous retribution will befall you. Hear me, this is the trust with which I charge you. Stay within the precincts of the Majid Ibaratha. On the third day after this dream, a scion of my house, Sir Kazim by name, will, accompanied by his friends and companions, alight at the hour of noon, beneath the shadow of the palm in the vicinity of the Majid. There he will offer his prayer. As soon as your eyes fall upon him, seek his presence and convey to him my loving greetings. Tell him from me, Rejoice, for the hour of your departure is at hand. When you shall have performed your visits in Kazimain and shall have returned to Kabila there three days after your return, on the day of Arifi, the 31st of December, A.D. 1843, you will wing your flight to me. Soon after shall he, who is the truth, be made manifest. Then shall the world be illuminated by the light of his face. A smile wreathed the countenance of Seed Kazim upon the completion of the description of the dream related by that shepherd. He said, Of the truth of the dream which you have dreamt there is no doubt. His companions were sorely grieved. Turning to them, he said, Is not your love for me for the sake of that true one whose advent we all await? Would you not wish me to die, that the promised one may be revealed? This episode, in its entirety, has been related to me by no less than ten persons, all of whom were present on that occasion, and who testified to its accuracy. And yet many of those who witnessed with their own eyes such marvellous signs have rejected the truth and repudiated his message. This strange event was noised abroad. It brought sadness to the hearts of the true lovers of Seyed Kazim. To these he, with infinite tenderness and joy, addressed words of cheer and comfort. He calmed their troubled hearts, fortified their faith, and inflamed their zeal. With dignity and calm he completed his pilgrimage and returned to Kabila. The very day of his arrival he fell ill and was confined to bed. His enemies spread the rumour that he had been poisoned by the governor of Baghdad. This was sheer calumny and downright falsehood, inasmuch as the governor himself had placed his unqualified confidence in Seyed Kazim and had always regarded him as a highly talented leader endowed with keen perception and possessed of irreproachable character. On the day of Arifi, in the year A.H. 1259, A.D. 1843, at the ripe age of sixty, Seyed Kazim, in accordance with the vision of that lowly shepherd, bade farewell to this world, leaving behind him a band of earnest and devoted disciples who, purged of all worldly desire, set out in quest of their promised beloved. His sacred remains were interred within the precincts of the shrine of the Imam Hussein. His passing raised a tumult in Karbila, similar to the agitation that seized its people in the preceding year. A footnote says, During the lifetime of Seyyid Qazim, the doctrine of the Sheikhis spread over all Persia so well that in the province of Iraq alone there were more than a hundred thousand murids. Journal Asiatique, 1866, volume 7, page 463. His passing raised a tumult in Kabila similar to the agitation that seized its people the preceding year on the eve of the day of Arifi when the victorious enemy forced the gates of the citadel and massacred a considerable number of its besieged inhabitants. A, a year before, on that day, his house had been the one haven of peace and security for the bereaved and homeless, whereas now it had become a house of sorrow where those whom he had befriended and succored wailed his passing and mourned his loss. The footnote here says, Here ends the history of the establishment of Sheikhism, or at least of its unity, for after the death of Seyyid Kazimi Rashti, it became divided into two branches. One branch, under the name of Babism, flowered as foreshadowed by the strength of the movement created by Sheikh Ahmad, thus fulfilling the expectations of the two masters, if one may believe their, in their predictions. The other, under the leadership of Karim Khan-i-Kajai-Kirmani, will continue its struggles against the Shiite sect, 
but will always seek security in affecting the outer appearance of Ithna Asharism. If, according to Karim Khan, the Bab and his followers are infamous and impious, for the Babis, Karim Khan is the Antichrist or Dajjal foretold by Muhammad. A.L.M. Nicholas is